It is indeed my pleasure to uh, introduce Faith Osia, who originally hails from the um, Kenya. How was it? Did you could you hear me? Um, someone is saying the audio was. Yeah, I'm just saying. But you didn't hear you because I muted this and I muted this. Who comes from uh, Kenya, from Camry? So. Um, Faith is actually the Vice President, President Elect of the International Union of Immunological Societies. Um, and uh, she's, uh, her research focuses on understanding how humans acquire immunity to malaria, um, obviously with the ultimate aim of translating this knowledge into effective malaria vaccines. You may be aware that there is a malaria vaccine out there right now. But the truth is that this vaccine is actually only about 30% effective. Bed nets uh, with pesticides are still the most effective way of controlling malaria in the absence of a really strong vaccine. And also there are some issues associated with um, perhaps uh, uh, gender specific effects of this particular malaria vaccine that's available now. Um, she's the leader of SMART, which is the South-South Malaria Anti Research Partnership which is a network of researchers that have shared resources to study antibody responses to the malaria parasite in multiple longitudinal cohorts in Africa. And her research group is spread over two continents, as I mentioned, at the Kemri Wellcome Trust Research Program in Kenya and at the Heidelberg University Hospital in Germany. One thing about uh, Dr. Osia is that she's passionate about the training of African scientists uh, to tackle the health issues that are very specific to that continent. So without any further ado, I'm going to uh, introduce Faith, a um, longtime friend and colleague. And uh, over to you, Faith. Um, thank you very much. Um, can everyone hear me OK? Um, I assume everyone can hear okay. <coughs> so um, thanks very much, Eleanor, for inviting me to this conference. And uh, thanks to everybody who's listening in um, of interest. So today I'm going to talk about learning to win against a parasite. And the parasite that I want to talk about is... Uh, we go to the next slide, please. Uh, it's Plasmodium falciparum. So this is a, a, parasit a parasitic infection that's uh, quite common in Africa. Um, so you'll see the, the, the statistics in front of you. There's millions of cases every year. Um, there's hundreds of thousands of deaths. Um, for survivors, there can be lifelong disability. This has obviously knock-on effects on families, so it's got an economic impact on the continent as a whole. Um, and although it can be treated, um, if you got malaria now, we could give you rapid-acting drugs. Um, sadly, um, resistance is developing to a lot of the drugs that we use for malaria, and so we need a solution to overcome this parasite. And uh, next slide, please. The solution that I'm particularly interested in is that of a malaria vaccine. Um, we've spoken about all challenges. You know, you can do drugs to control malaria. You can use bed nets, etc. But in the long term, Vaccines are the most effective and cost-effective solutions for places like Africa, where the health infrastructure is weak. Um, and so I'm really pushing that we try and develop a highly effective malaria vaccine. And this is the, the goal of, uh, of what I, I try to do. Next slide, please. So why do I think that it's possible? Well. Firstly, people actually win against this parasite by becoming immune to it. If you look at the graph in front of you, what you will see is that uh, there are three lines. There's a green, a blue, and an orange. And what the green line shows us is that um, the, 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 the prevalence 
of malaria in children is very high, up to 100%. Um, but by the time children become 10, they don't get severe malaria anymore. So the green line is severe malaria, and it shows that it's really common in young children, especially under the age of five. But after that, it disappears rapidly from the community. These were data taken from Kilifi about 20 years ago. Um, and these data are typical of a place that has a lot of malaria, high malaria transmission. If you look at the blue line, that um, shows the frequency of mild malaria. So mild malaria is a pretty bad sickness. Uh, I think mild is a bit of a misnomer. Uh, when you have malaria, you've got headache, you've got tummy ache, you can barely move. So you feel pretty nasty. Um, and if you look at the frequency of that in the population, again, you see that it's quite high in young children under the age of 10. But after the age of 10, it drops more gradually um, until about the age of 30. And then it also kind of disappears from the population. So these are people who, as young children, they suffered severe malaria. Uh, as they got older, they suffered from mild malaria. But then all these, as they become young adults, they stop having these. But what remains is asymptomatic infection. So that's marked by the orange line. And that's when you have parasites in your blood. And actually, you're happy with them, and the parasite seems to be happy with you. Um, you don't have any headache. You don't have any clinical symptoms. You might go to school as normal. Um, <coughs> but nevertheless, you've got parasites in your blood. So what we're seeing is that people's bodies over time are learning how to deal with the parasite. They get infected with the parasite. They don't get severe disease, which might kill them. They don't get mild disease, which makes them feel really rough. And they still get infections, but they're able to keep the infections at a low density and continue with their everyday business of life. And so the fact is that people do become immune to malaria. People do learn how to win against the parasite. Next slide. The next, uh, uh, the next bit of evidence uh, for why we can, we think we can make a good malaria vaccine is because antibodies were shown to be able to treat parasites almost just like a drug. Um, these are experiments that were done in the 60s and what they did was that they took IgG antibodies from people who had learned how to cope with malaria and they injected them into patients that were sick, that had come to hospital with acute malaria. And the graph there shows the results of the experiment. Parasite density dropped by orders of magnitude and temperature, a uh, marker of clinical symptoms, that also resolved. And so here we see that antibody, IgG antibody, was getting rid of parasites in the same way that a drug would today. So the bit of evidence, one, people can become immune, the bodies can learn how to win, and two, that winningness can be transferred to somebody else by the means of IgG from someone who is experienced at handling malaria. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and so immunology 101, you learned um, that antibodies bind onto something. Um, and I have in front of us a malaria cycle, and now isn't the time to get us cramming the malaria cycle. Uh, but what I do want to point out is that the antibodies that I'm interested in are binding to the parasite when it's in the blood stage of the infection. So the parasite has a big life cycle. It can be in many places at different times. And what I'm concentrating on is just the blood stage of the parasite.
And here you can see in the box something called Merozoic. Um, we'll have a look at a movie of this in a minute, but um, looking at antibodies binding to these parasites and getting rid of them. Um, if we go to the next slide, um, this is where we should have the movie. And let's see if this works. Yes, that's great. So there you have a merozoite that's in your blood circulation. Those are red cells. And that's my malaria parasite. It finds a cell that it likes. Um, it attaches to it, orients itself, invades the red cell. And once it's in the red cell, it multiplies, forms many daughter cells. Those will burst out of those red cells and invade other cells, uh, and the cycle continues. So it takes 48 hours, um, and new merozoites are released, and, they, and the cycle continues, and that's when you're feeling like you're really sick um, and in trouble. So next slide, please. So let's try and make a malaria vaccine. I've given you the background. Let's see, how can we make a malaria vaccine? So first off, which parasite proteins shall we put in? How do we know that they're good ones? How do we know that we've selected the right proteins? And how do we find out how exactly the antibodies against them work? So I told you antibodies got to bind to something. Can we understand better exactly how they work? And this is really, these are the questions that uh, my group tries to answer. Um, next slide, please. So there's our merozoite um, that we saw in the movie. Um, it's got lots of organelles. It's got lots of, lots of the usual stuff that um, organisms have. And uh, because antibodies, normally bind to things that are on the surface, things that are exposed. The proteins that I began to look at in my studies are proteins that are on the surface of the merozoid. There are also proteins in these apical organelles um, that are secreted onto the surface at the time the parasite is getting into the red cell. And so next slide. Uh, this is one of my uh, PhD students who's uh, recently completed, um, and she's driven a lot of the work on, on trying to understand which parasite proteins should we try and include in our vaccine. <coughs> because I've already mentioned that we're using, uh, looking at things on the surface, she did um, surface proteomics essentially used um, biochemical tools to shave the merozoid surface so that we could understand all the proteins that were just on the surface. So the merozoid by itself actually contains over 800 proteins. And if you want to study that, study all those, it could take you quite a bit of time. Um, and so we wanted to be more specific. Uh, and we said antibodies likely bind to the surface. So let's go for what's on the surface and what's secreted. Um, and so to do that, she did some surface proteomics. We also used immunoproteomics because we said, well, whatever, whatever antibodies are, are, are working to kill parasites, they've got to be immunogenic. The immune system has got to see them. So we used another, some other techniques to characterize what's the immunoproteome, what's immunogenic in this merozoid. And we combined this with bioinformatics kit, uh, bioinformatic toolkit, and just looking for things that are expressed, things that come to the surface, et cetera, to try and, um, and just home in from a big number of proteins to a manageable size that could be studied within the context of a PhD. And so Gadoni, who's pictured here, um, put these uh, three methods together um, and then prioritized the proteins that she found through all three techniques. So each technique gave her a bunch of proteins. And actually, from her work, we've got over 200 proteins that are of interest to study.
But what she focused on was her, her top hits, and these are the 34 that you see there. Um, the figure at the bottom just shows that over 80% of the proteins in the merozoite had not been studied in the context of protective immunity. And so <coughs> a, a side point from here is that although we've been trying to make malaria vaccines for a long time, we've focused on only a few proteins, and there's still large parts of the parasite that we haven't considered um, as, as, as vaccine candidates. Um, next slide, please. So if you figure out that, yeah, I want to test protein X, Y, and Z, then the next thing is you've got to make the protein. Um, and that's what this slide is about. If you want to test me, well, you've got to make me first. Um, and so we've got a great postdoc in the lab. Um, this is pictured here, James Tuju. And he's set up a system where we can actually make the protein, a recombinant version of the protein in the lab. Um, and so we use um, transient transfection um, in commercially uh, in cells that we buy, and we go through the expression and the purification, etc. Um, and this is really um, this is really critical because even if you think you know the protein, if you can't make it, then there's no way that we can test it. There's no way that we can do all the assays that we need to do around it. And so um, Gadoni expressed the 34 proteins um, that I showed you on the previous slide. And then going on to the next slide, having tested, having expressed the proteins, <coughs> she then tested um, those proteins using what we might call positive and negative control serum. Positive zera are zera from people who've had malaria many times, and so there are, they've made antibodies to most of the malaria proteins. And negative zera are zera from people who've never traveled to Africa, never been in a malaria area, and so their immune system hasn't had the chance to respond to malaria. And if you look at the graph in front of you, um, there's three graphs. AMA1 is an antigen, a malaria parasite protein that we've known for a long time. It's a leading vaccine candidate antigen. It's a very immunogenic antigen. And I've put it up there as a, as a, to show you what, you know, what we already know. For example, AMA1, if you look at immune people, you get a very good response shown by the red line. If you look at non-immune people, you don't see any response. Um, and that's the typical experiment that we expect. And the next two graphs, I've given you two antigens from Gadoni's set, um, just to show you the kind of data that she got. And basically, she found uh, very good responses, indicated here in red, to two new antigens. These are antigens that people have not been studying before, and that these antigens were not recognized by people who have not seen malaria. And so it was really mighty and interesting for us because what we were seeing is <clears throat> our strategy of kind of going back to the basics, go back to the parasite, find out which proteins should be studied. Actually, we turned up some antigens that were just as immunogenic as the ones that we've been studying for years, which means that there's a lot of potential in going back to the parasite. Um, and uh, so we're really excited about this. And uh, Gadoni is um, doing a few more experiments and writing up her papers. So let's go to the next slide. So the first thing was to say which proteins to choose. And I've shown you a strategy of how we've chosen our proteins and that the data is looking really interesting. They're looking immunogenic. The next question we ask is, well, how do you know these are the, are these proteins good to go? Are they the right ones? Um, and what we do here is uh, prospective cohort studies. Um, I put this disco dancers just to tease you. The prospective studies um, do not have to be done in disco dancers, in discos at night. Uh, don't get me wrong. <laughs> 
Um, what we do is simply go out into the community and we recruit volunteers. Um, and what we do is we monitor to see who gets malaria and who doesn't. Malaria typically comes in a rainy season, so we start our observation at the beginning of the rainy season. We take a blood sample from everybody, and then we watch the individuals over six months, over a year, and we see who got malaria and who didn't get malaria. So at the end of the study, we have two groups of people. My six dancers, you could imagine them split in the middle here. Three of them got malaria and three of them didn't get malaria. Our typical study would have about 300 patients, um, 300 volunteers, not patients. Um, and then we would compare their blood and say, which antibodies did the people that did not get malaria have compared to those that got malaria. And then using that, we try to work out, well, did that look like a good protein or was it not a good protein? So I'm gonna show you some results that kind of bring that to life. Um, uh, I think I've jumped my own slide. Let's go back. Yes, that's great, thank you. So what you can see in front of you is, um, is data from studying a number of proteins in uh, a cohort study of children in Kenya. And on the x-axis along there, you can see all the different proteins that we studied, proportion uh, and uh, the protective efficacy. So the pro proportion is, is the same as the prevalence. That's indicated by the blue bars. And that's basically saying if you had 100 people, what percent of them had antibodies to the antigen that you're looking at? So, for example, for the first antigen, just 10% of people made a response to that antigen. But if they did, then their protective efficacy, basically it's another way of saying their chance of getting malaria was very low. So it had a high protective efficacy. So I've arranged these antigens such that the ones that are the best, the ones that look really good, um, they are here. And as we go down this way, they're getting worse and worse. And by the time we're here, they're kind of hopeless. Um, and so there's quite a number of points to take away from this. First is that um, we found a lot of antigens had protective efficacy that was reasonable, reasonable when you compare it to the RTSS malaria vaccine. That's the most advanced vaccine that we have for malaria at the moment. Everything to the left of this line um, is as good in terms of protective efficacy as the vaccine. Uh, as, as the malaria vaccine. So we haven't actually done any vaccination studies um, and protective efficacy here is just saying, if you have a response to this antigen, what's your chance of getting malaria? And so point number one is there's quite a lot of antigens that look good um, and some of them are being studied, but many are not being studied. Um, there's some that are pretty hopeless and you can immediately um, you know, you can, you can immediately discard those. Uh, the other important thing really is that if you look here, the, the prevalence is pretty low for some of the things that appear to be really good. Um, look really good, but not many people have them. Um, and so what can we do with that information? We'll go to the next slide, please. Um, Right, so here are the same information as the next graph, as the, as the slide before, except that I've now put the antigens on the x, on the y-axis, um, and this is a heat map. Here I have people who did not get malaria, and these ones got, any, got malaria. And I want to see whether you can spot a pattern. Can you see a pattern here that you don't see here? Um, and if you can, please send me a message on, on the chat box. I'd be, I'd be really happy to hear from you. Uh, actually, we looked at this for a long time, um, and even with the help of a statistician, we couldn't really see a pattern. What we could see 
is that more seemed to be better, but it wasn't random. Um, if you look at the blue responses, so these are the ones that, that gave some protective efficacy, what we could see was that the people who did not get malaria, they made more responses than the ones who did get malaria. So more seemed to be better, but it wasn't more of anything. If we looked at the non-protective responses, there really was no difference between those who got malaria and those who didn't. Um, and so more was good, but it wasn't a random, it wasn't random. And so we tried to pin down what exactly was that more. Um, and we found, we looked at combinations of five antigens each. And what we found was really interesting that if you were clever and you had acted the right five antigens, then your chance of getting malaria was practically nil. And that's what we see with the blue here. Um, if you looked at responses to just one antigen, which is what we have here, um, your protective efficacy was not as high as if you were able to make a clever selection to a number of antigens. And the black is indicating random antigens. If you just chose random antigens, again, you lost your effect. You needed to be clever, choose the right ones, and make high levels of antibodies, and then we could see 100% protection. And so that's an example of how we say, well, you made a bunch of antigens. How do you know whether they are any good or not? And what I've told you is that we use cohort studies. Um, and uh, this is the sort of analysis that we do that gives us some information on whether the antigens are good or not. And finally, I'm going to talk to you about mechanisms, because after all, this is immunology. Um, and you're all wondering, well, where's the real immunology faith? Uh, and so there's so many mechanisms in malaria. And I put this slide to show that a lot has been shown uh, about how the immune system um, deals with malaria parasites. And I can't go into all of them. Um, but I want to talk about a couple. Um, and again, this is work done by students, um, Dennis. Um, um, so here we've got the antibody-dependent respiratory burst. Um, and here what we're looking at is neutrophils. Um, and we're looking at merozoites, antibodies talking to binding to merozoites with the FAB part of the antibody and the FC part of the antibody interacting with the FC receptor on the neutrophil to release reactive oxygen species that would then kill the parasite. Um, on this side, this is Fatma here, um, and she was looking at growth inhibition assays. And this is simply like a neutralization assay. Here's a merozoite. It wants to do its thing and invade the red cell. But the antibodies come, and they bind to it, and they block the receptors that it uses. Uh, they, they block the proteins that it uses to engage with the red cell, and it can't, get, it can't get in. And so that's a growth inhibition assay. And so we've looked at some of these assays, some um, of the studies that we've done. Um, and we have actually more questions than answers when we do. So we studied a bunch of adults in Kilifi. Remember, I, I showed you data from Kilifi, and I told you the adults are immune, they have parasites, and they don't get sick. So we did our assay as to have very high levels of growth inhibition. Actually, we were surprised to find that, yeah, there were a, a few adults that had really high levels of growth inhibition. But in fact, there were some down here who had practically nothing. And the question we're asking ourselves is, are these people really immune? And if they are, how come they don't have a lot of activity in the growth inhibition assay? We found that children had a, a similar distribution. Um, the medians went in the right direction, so more adults did it than children. And this is non-immune sera, so we don't expect anything here, and that's correctly low. Um, but the puzzle is, how come so few people have a strong 
have strong activity in a growth inhibition assay, which is kind of your everyday assay for malaria. Everybody does it. Um, we looked at another assay, um, and this is the respiratory burst assay, um, and this was work from Linda's PhD. And again, interestingly, very few people had really strong activity in the assay. Overall, adults had more than children. That's good. That's expected. And they had more than um, non-exposed adults. That's fine. But again, there were so many adults at the bottom here begging the question, if these people are immune, is, that the, is it that they utilize another mechanism or is it that our assays just aren't right? Um, so Linda looked a little bit more in children this time. Um, and what she did was she did a combination of the assays and what her results were are here. So she measured a bunch of things that are listed there. And when she looked at the growth inhibition assay alone and said, you know, did it, what, if you did GIA, um, were you protected against severe malaria? That's what she found that, yeah, maybe, but it wasn't statistically significant. Likewise, when she looked at the neutrophil assay on its own, again, maybe, but really not statistically significant. But when she looked at children who could actually do both things, she found a very strong, significant result. And so what it told us was that although we are trying to look at the mechanisms one by one by one, in fact, in the body, all these things happen at the same time. And so we probably need to try and build a more comprehensive picture, putting together as many mechanisms together as we can find. And the last one I want to talk about is uh, phagocytosis. Um, and this is work that's carrying forward with Irene, a PhD student with me. Um, and this we did with uh, monocyte cells. So you'll be familiar with THP1 cells. Um, and what you can see here is an empty, a hungry monocyte, as I call it. And on the other side, you can see a monocyte that's having its tea, and actually what it's having for tea is merozoids. Um, and here what we've done is that we incubate the TH, the merozoids with antibodies, and then we incubate uh, the merozoid antibody mixture with the THP1 cells so that the antibodies through the FC portion can talk to the monozoid. There's a merozoid on board and it can go ahead and chew up the merozoid. And when we looked at this activity in studies in Kenya, what we found was that if your antibodies were able to talk to your monocytes, then your chance of getting malaria was low, as indicated by this black line here. You took, and you, and you took a longer time to get an episode of malaria compared to people whose antibodies didn't have this activity. What was also really interesting was that um, the phagocytosis index that we calculated in our assay actually correlated very nicely with the breadth of the antibody response. So if you recall a few slides back, I said, the more things that you were clever to select, then the better your outcome. And what we could see was that the more things that you selected, then the better you were at phagocytosis. So again, another picture of things working together to get rid of things in the body. And this time, it's the combination of antibodies. And so to sum up, uh, I've taken you along the path of trying to make a vaccine. Um, I've shown you that, first of all, we need to choose good proteins. Um, winners, uh, people winning against the parasite are making responses to the right parasite proteins. And so we need to find them. Uh, we need to test whether they're really good. I showed you studies we've done in Kenya. More recently, we're expanding those to do them more broadly across Africa so that we can be really confident of what we are seeing. And I've shown you studies of mechanisms, trying to understand, well, how exactly do the antibodies work? This is an area that still needs quite a lot of work. Um, and so there's, there's lots of exciting stuff to do there.
Uh, and with that, I'd like to show you my team. And uh, this is us in Kenya, uh, lovely place, Kilifi. If you haven't visited, do plan to visit at some point. Um, and finally, I'd like to thank my collaborators, um, all the people that work together with me, and all the people that have funded our work. Thank you very much. Dr. Oyer, that was a very interesting presentation. And we have lots of questions for you here from the audience. Uh, can you hear okay. us? Okay, great. Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Okay. One second here. So our first question is, is the method of Antonio Lenzo Vecchia of isolating natural antibodies against parasites being used to develop a vaccine? And would this be too expensive? Um, I don't think that it's necessarily um, too expensive, um, and I think that it, it's a good way because it's again it's starting from responses that you know real people are making against the parasite. Um, I don't think it's too expensive. I think people are trying lots of different things, um, and ultimately we're all chasing down trying to pin down a malaria. A vaccine. So no, I don't. I don't think it's too expensive. Um, I think that he has to keep trying, and the, and, the, and the scientists working with him, and we'll also be watching to see to see what they what they come up with. Okay, great. Thank you. And another question another is. Question. Uh, do Marozaites invade specific red blood cells or just random ones? You have to. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, yes, yes, yes. Uh, so uh, some merozoids, I mean, merozoids, um, yes, they invade um, young. Um, young red blood cells. Um, they seem to prefer those preferentially. Um, yeah, but uh, what, exactly which one it chooses, <laughs> I don't think that uh, anyone can say, but there's certainly a preference for younger as opposed to older red blood cells. Just uh, checking, can you still hear us? You have been. I can see the question on high variation. Okay, our next question is okay. what question is, types of innate to adapt the transition of immune detection occurs within the liver? Uh, sorry, so I didn't get the question. Let me see if I can read it. Um, do you mind repeating the question? I can't hear you. Sorry, I was just asking. Also. Read the question. 
Okay, our next question uh, was, what type of innate to adaptive transition of immune detection occurs within the liver? You have been cellular responses that detect the parasite when it's in the hepatocytes. Um, so there's CD8 cells and CD4 T cells um, that people have been studying for um, the potential mechanisms by which the immune system could deal with the parasite while in the liver. Okay, for, for the next questions, would you be able to read it from the chat box? You have been... Yes. So, I, it's still on the question of innate. Uh, we haven't moved to the next question on the chat box. Oh. Oh. Okay, this is the next question. So given the extremely high variation in human anti-malaria traits, wouldn't you expect equally high variation in plasmodium antigenic presentation? One example is malaria in pregnancy. And wouldn't this prevent development of a widely efficacious vaccine? You have been. Um, absolutely. So I didn't mention at all antigenic variation, but lots of the proteins that we study are actually polymorphic. Um, and the parasite has an incredible uh, number of mechanisms for changing um, like changing its coat of many colors. And so this is a big problem for vaccine development. And um, I didn't go into it in my talk, but for all the proteins that we study, this is something that we have to contend with, um, particularly for vaccine development, because studies so far have shown that um, the polymorphisms can um, the, uh, there, are mean of, there are means of the parasite to evade immunity. And so when you're making your vaccine, um, the approaches people are taking are trying to include um, different alleles of particular proteins, uh, making combination vaccines, um, trying to look at conserved parts of the protein, um, so the of the parasite, proteins that are conserved within the, prote of the, within the parasite, so there's lots of different things that people are trying to overcome the problem of diversity, which would make it very difficult. Great. Thank you so much for the explanations. There's a couple more questions in the chat box. So if you could uh, answer them by typing in the chat box, that would be really great. And thank you again for your time. We really appreciate you speaking at our conference. Thank you.